Hey, it's Juck, and it's two months of Juck on Bucks today, and despite what our old lady said, we're still going strong. Let's get it. And I don't think he's going to throw the ball as much as he thinks he's going to throw the ball now that Chip Kelly's in for it. And I'm happy about that. More quarterback. Um, the truth is, Ryan Day has made a change philosophically, but it's none of those. You all know who wins. LSU is the drunkest fan base in the country. To start, that means we've got... And welcome into the show. And it is a big day as it is two months of Juck on Bucks today. And a big day for a couple of Buckeyes too, as superstar transfers, Quinshawn Judkins and Caleb Downs both got their black stripe removed and are officially Buckeyes. Appreciate y'all accepting me here. I'm glad to be here. Wouldn't want to be nowhere else. Go Buck. Hey! I thought for sure these guys would be the first two to lose those, but JJ Smith did first, setting the record. And the kid's unbelievable. You know, we should have expected it from the beginning. And the Buckeyes practiced on Tuesday, and they're going to practice again on Thursday and then again on Saturday. And that'll be the student appreciation practice. And that practice is going to feature a little bit of a scrimmage. And the press is finally going to be allowed back in to record some of that so that they can share that action with us. Um, that'll be practice number eight of the 15 spring practices. And we have not seen anything come out of there since practice number two, excluding a couple of pro day clips. And on those pro day clips, we got to see a little more of Will Howard and Devin Brown throwing. So that was pretty cool. But this is going to be a really exciting one. I can't wait to see him back in action. Um, I saw today from Bill Curlick that Seth McLaughlin has lined up at guard for a little bit recently. And that jives with what we've been hearing about Carson Hinsman, who just may actually beat him out for that center position. Carson looks fantastic. He looks way thicker. You can see it. It's very visible. Uh, he definitely busted his butt in the offseason after getting benched in the Missouri game. And I'm really proud of the kid. Put his head down and grinded. Um, you know, he could have been a real sourpuss after that. He probably would have seen some kids transfer after that, but he did not. And, you know, I'm just trying to keep in mind, like the kid didn't, wasn't excellent last year. He wasn't bad, but he was a freshman starting on the offensive line at Ohio State, and that is rare. And it just kind of goes to show how much he's got in him. And I really am rooting for him to win that job. That would be just a great story to me. Um, Bill Curlick, it was interesting that he was the one that came out and shared that information because there were some people, myself included, who thought that it was a possibility that McLaughlin may end up at guard at Ohio State. And Bill Curlick was having none of that during that transfer. And just about as nasty as a sweet old man could be, he was about that. Um, but I love that dude. But the number of times that these guys come out and angrily tell us Buckeye fans that basically, you know, we're wrong and they get it wrong is innumerable. So I'm going to point it out every time I see it. And Bill was wrong. We were right on that one. But uh, the Julian Sayan hype machine in full effect. Cannot wait to see him. We've seen next to nothing of Julian Sayan. Maybe 30 seconds of clips total. And we've seen next to nothing of anybody, really. Um, but I really can't wait to see him. And this is just going to be fantastic. I can't wait. And we've never had a team with this many interesting storylines going into it. This many different personalities this many high profile transfers. The team is the most intriguing team in the country by a mile. And so much so that Fox is now televising our spring game. I have rearranged plans that I was, I was going to go out of town. I was going to Scottsdale with my wife and I postponed that trip because I want to go to spring, the spring game that bad this year. Um, and she wasn't too happy about it as you can imagine, <laughs> but she's okay with it. So that's going to happen. Um, and it's only Tuesday. I need to chill out my excitement uh, for this uh, this scrimmage on Saturday. But we're going to get uh, a lot of clips. We're going to get uh, our guy Dylan Davis back in here uh, to talk about what happened when he was there because he's going to film a bunch of stuff on Saturday. And today we had some coaches talk after practice. It was supposed to be three, but Tony Alford was one of them, so it was only two. And it was Larry Johnson and Keenan Bailey. And... Uh, you know, we had Dylan Davis on over the weekend, and until he pointed out the possibility of going through the season without a running back coach, I had not really considered that as a possibility. But since he said that, I've seen quite a few talk about it. Uh, and he said something in that interview that all of a sudden we're hearing all over the place. He was talking about a one-year deal, and it kind of just flew over my head. But all of a sudden, I'm starting to hear from a lot of different places that Ryan Day was offering one-year deals to people. Now, I don't know if that's true. I haven't seen it officially reported. 
but if he was offering one-year deals to Robert Gillespie uh, and DeMarco, like, that would really be surprising to me. So if anybody has seen, I just saw that when I first started recording. If anybody's seen that, where that came from, let me know. Because I haven't seen an official report on that or somebody, you know, with any reputable name put that in print. Um, but I have been seeing it on Twitter by a lot of fans and somebody put it in my comments. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. But if it is, and he went to a guy like Robert Gillespie, who's at Alabama, and offered him a one-year deal, obviously that was never going to fly asking him to leave Alabama to come to Ohio State. Uh, or DeMarco, same thing. I mean, these guys are at Alabama and Oklahoma. They're not leaving for a one-year deal and burning a bridge at a place like that. So that would really surprise me if that was, you know, verified to be true. And I'd be really disappointed. I really would. But let's go over a couple of quotes that we heard today. Uh, Keenan Bailey, for one, sounded exactly like Brian Hartline the other day, which is absolutely no voice left. And I love that. It reminds me of my old football coaches when I was young. Um, I think Keenan Bailey is a really interesting coach on this staff. A lot of people didn't like that hire. Uh, they didn't like hiring another young guy. They thought there was not enough adults in the room. We heard it a lot last year. Uh, they didn't like hiring a guy in the building. But, you know, I got to say, that guy, their, their line, the coaching staff line for hiring him was he brought a ton of value consistently in the time he's worked there, always going above and beyond. And... You know, sometimes I think it's good to have a few guys like that mixed in on the staff. So I didn't fault him for hiring this guy. But Keenan Bailey, um, he, he's got a spot today or th this year. He's got to work some magic because right now what he's got in the tight end room, you know, we got, uh, we got maybe a situation here because it's looking like, from what we're hearing, Will Kaczmarek is not uh, acclimating as quickly as we had hoped to moving up in competition from the MAC to the Big Ten, well, from the MAC to Ohio State because he's playing against, uh, you know, big dogs across from him, and he's not picking it up so fast as is the reports we're seeing coming out of there. Um, I stuck my neck out on this guy, so he better not disappoint me because I've been saying for a while I think this dude's going to be a stud, and I still think he will be. He's got all the physical tools; we've seen them. He's got the right attitude. We've seen that. Um, I, I just really, I, I just want to believe in him because let's put it this way, man. Keenan Bailey is going to earn his money this year. And if he can pull this off and those guys end up looking really good, then we're going to know what kind of coach he is. He's definitely got a great opportunity. We'll put it that way. Um, Jelani Thurman, Keenan said that he's going to have to uh, see something out of him and he's going to anticipate that he's going to see some significant playing time. So, That'll be really interesting. Obviously, Jelani's a freak. Uh, everybody who's, you know, Dylan Davis said it when he was on here. He's a, the kind of guy when he's on campus, when he first shows up, you're just like, whoa. Um, and those type of guys are, uh, you know, they're hard to find. And I would love to see him on the field. But undoubtedly, G. Scott is the leader of the room. Keenan said that today. The problem is, I mean, G's great. Everybody loves G. G's, G might be a captain this year. I wouldn't be surprised at all if he was. But G's a little undersized. He's a receiver, tra you know, transitioned to a tight end, and he's not the best blocker. Counting on him to play a whole lot of snaps and counting on his blocking is a liability. It just is. He also takes poor angles. It's it, Consistently, I see it all the time from him. He just doesn't got a good knack for it. And when you're a little undersized, you know, that's what you need. And he doesn't have that, you know, that innate ability. Some some guys have that feel to just innately know how to take a proper angle, and he doesn't. So that's concerning. And uh, they really need Will Kaz to step it up. Um, Bennett Christian is a real unknown after being suspended last year for uh, PEDs. Um, you know, who knows? He stuck around. He practiced hard all year, mostly on the scout team. So kudos to him for that. But we'll see. I don't know, man. This room's a little concerning, and it's sounding more and more concerning by the day. But uh, I got faith in Will Kaz. <laughs> it's got to be Will Kaz, because if it's not Will Kaz, I just don't think G is capable of, of really being that, that every-down guy. Um, and that's for sure. LJ came out, and he discussed uh, the second group of defensive linemen first and talked about getting them, hopefully in the games this year, 25 to 35 plays 
and doing it early and doing it often, getting him ready for the long haul. That's awesome. He had the first uh, unit not playing a lot this spring so far with Jack and JT, Ty Leak and Ty Hamilton taking a lot of breaks. I think that's great. Definitely the proper course of action. Let those young dudes eat. Uh, the second group of guys, according to Larry, is at N, Kenyatta, Caden Curry, and Mitchell Melton. Pretty much what we were thinking. And then at tackle, Caden McDonald and Hero Canoe and Jason Moore. So good for Moore. Uh, when he talked about Kenyatta, he talked about a lack of consistency again. I really love Kenyatta. The dude is uh, just got all the gifts you could ever ask for. Um, but we just heard Ryan Day say the other day, Kenyatta uh, needs to believe in himself more. And now today we hear Larry talk about him and his thing is he needs to be more consistent. And every time we hear about Kenyatta, it's always a kind of a motivational thing for Kenyatta. Uh, it's never just effusive praise of Kenyatta. So I don't know. I'm hoping that this dude can put it all together because he's got all the skill in the world, but it doesn't sound like he's there yet. Uh, as for Caden Curry, I think he is. I think Caden Curry is going to have a really good season, and I can't wait to see him. Larry gave some uh, interesting insight on uh, Edric Houston and signing day when he had essentially flipped to Alabama. They couldn't get the kid on the phone. Uh, and that's got to be tough, man. You know, this dude's, <laughs> this dude's an old man who develops a relationship with a 17-year-old kid for a year and a half, puts all this effort into it, and 10 minutes before the kid's got a sign, he's gone totally dark, radio silent, um, hearing a bunch of rumors that he's going to Alabama. Scary situation. Um, but uh, I always find those, those inside stories really interesting, and they don't usually share them. So kudos to Larry for putting us uh, on the inside on that. And he's, he's got his full press conference over on 11 Warriors, if you want to see everything Larry had to say. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. He's always nice to listen to talk to. We don't hear from him much. So I always, uh, always listen whenever we get, to, get a chance to hear Larry. Um, Dylan Davis said last week he brought up Taiwan Malone and said he looks fantastic. LJ today said he's coming around real nice. He was behind because of baseball, but he's seen some real growth from him. So it could be an excellent year for the defensive line, and they're going to need it if they're going to win a championship, that's for sure. Uh, we had a little bit of a tussle uh, the other day with the Georgia fan base uh, when I did a, a video talking about the Buckeyes being the IT team and not the Georgia Bulldogs. And they represented themselves pretty well in the comment section. Quite a few of them were really cool, and they just wanted to talk football. Um, but those dogs landed themselves a big one with Jared Curtis, widely considered the number one quarterback in the class of 2026. He signed with the dogs last week. The Buckeyes were the leader in the clubhouse for Jared Curtis when Corey Dennis was here. When Corey left and Bill O'Brien came in and then Bill O'Brien left, things kind of fizzled out and boom, this kid ends up getting tighter with the dogs and then he ends up signing with them. So the Buckeyes have restructured their quarterback board. And I find this 2026 quarterback recruitment really interesting because I think that the guy that they end up with could tell us potentially give us a clue of how long Chip plans on staying here. You know, if we're talking about a true dual threat guy that ends up coming in or they end up targeting to be their main guy here, does that mean he intends to really work through this three-year contract? Because a whole lot of Buckeye fans don't think that that's the case. Um, I think my initial thought here on this is if Ryan Day, as tight as they are, told him from the start, listen, I want you to stay for three years. If you're going to do this, then I think Chip will. But we don't know if, if that's the way that conversation went down. But we also can't dismiss that there's potential that they did a three-year deal for posturing, um, knowing that Chip was never going to stay the three years, but signing him to a three-year deal optically looks really good for recruiting and for the guys that are here. I've seen that argument made. It's definitely a possibility. I don't think we can totally dismiss that either. But I do think that if there's a true dual threat and they choose to really pursue one hard, that that might speak to Chipper staying around at least three years. Because Ryan, or, or maybe a total shift in philosophy for Ryan, that maybe he's going to embrace that. You got guys that like to run the quarterback, guys that don't like to run the quarterback, and you got Ryan Day, and this guy is uh, quarterback run adverse. And he's been like that as long as he's been here so the bucks had already offered brady smigel who's one of the top quarterbacks in the country he's out of uh, california 
and he is a Michigan lean. Now, this dude's one of the top guys in the class, a Michigan lean, and if I were to show you a picture of the 10 top kids in that class and said, show me the kid that is the Michigan lean, just off the picture, you would pick this guy. I mean, look at that face. If that's not a face of a Michigan man, I don't know what is. But uh, <laughs> listen, that would be a massive get for Michigan. After losing Bryce Underwood, you know, number one quarterback in the class to LSU in the class of 2025, that top quarterback, he was in their backyard. They lost him. And I think that getting Smigel would be a massive win for Sharon Moore on the recruiting trail. And they usually don't get guys this highly rated. So that would really be something for them. So the Bucks restructure, who are we going to go after? Well, they made some offers here recently. They offered Dia Bell. That's the son of NBA star Raja Bell out of Heritage, Brandon Innes' school down in South Florida. He's six foot 195, and a lot of people have him as their number one. Uh, over the weekend, they offered Noah Grubbs, 6'4", 205. Uh, these kids are big, man. <laughs> these kids are really big. Uh, Noah Grubbs is rivals number three overall quarterback. He's also out of Florida, and he was blown away and flattered by the Buckeyes' offer. Truly humbled the way they did it. The entire staff came and offered him all at once. So I really like the way this kid talks. He seems like a really, uh, really humble kid and a really grateful kid. So I really like him, Noah Grubbs. Also, Jonah Williams out of Illinois. Uh, he was also at the Woody over the weekend, 6'3", 185. That's Rivals number six quarterback. And he is a true dual threat. Uh, I was thinking today, as we talk about the 2026 quarterback class, that it's really interesting because the quarterback evaluations, let's talk about them. So Kyle McCord, I think most people think at this point was a miss. You know, Ryan Day just missed on that one. What if Devin Brown ends up transferring out? Then you've got two straight classes that were essentially misses. And what if Lincoln Kineholz gets passed up? Then you got three straight classes. Three straight classes of guys that would have combined for one year of subpar starting quarterback play at Ohio State. That would be something, man. That would really be that would really be something. Um, now the verdict is still out on Devin. We don't know what's going to happen. Lincoln, same thing. But hypothetically, that would be something because it looks like it's a it's a decent proposition that Devin may not be the guy and may end up transferring. I'd say it's a decent proposition. And I think it's also a decent proposition that Julian Sand or even Aaron Nolan ends up passing Lincoln, and Lincoln never really becomes the guy at Ohio State. Something to think about. Devin Brown has uh, one of the top 10 highlight reels I've ever seen in high school. The dude was awesome. And I think if you've never seen it, it might change your opinion on him. It, it, it might at least surprise you. If you're someone who's down on Devin Brown, it might surprise you to watch his high school footage. It is really something. I mean, the kid is dynamic. He really is. Um, but he could end up as a miss too, just like McCord. But I do think it's interesting to talk about. Um, does it change the way he pursues quarterbacks? Does he start going after guys with a little more, uh, I don't know, ability to, ability to move, ability to run, and incorporate that into the game? I think he might. I really do. And I would be down for it. I definitely would because I don't really love being such a pass heavy team. I would like a little more of a run, a little more of a run game. And when you get a guy who's just an excellent passer of the ball, you kind of fall into that trap where you're just throwing a ton and throwing, throwing, throwing. And we've seen Ryan fall back into that at times during his career. And I just hate it when he, when he, it's like a crutch for him. Like we're just throwing the ball and that's it. And you got to run the ball, man. You got to be able to run the ball. And having a quarterback that can do it is all the better. So I would like to see that happen. Hey, it's Juck, and my bookie has some free cash for the Juck on Bucks audience. Open up an account today at my bookie, and we're going to get a 50% deposit bonus of up to 1000 bucks in free bets with the promo code Juck. If you're new to sports books, this is a good one to start at. And if you're an old vet, they got everything we want. It's very simple to use. You can pull out your winnings instantly, and they have an extensive selection of wagering options, including straight bets, parlay bets across sports, odds boosts, and even free plays pop up every now and again. If you like props, they got a whole slew of those, and these guys even got a casino over at MyBookie. And to let us try that out, 
They got a $10 casino chip with our promo code JUCK. I like to bet some basketball during the tournament for a little bit of fun. I go a little heavier during football season, but no matter what your sport or your favorite wagering option is, you can find it at MyBookie. So open up your account today at MyBookie with the promo code JUCK because betting is fun, but betting with somebody else's money is even more fun. Check them out. And I just find that an interesting storyline. Because when we talk about college football, I believe that part of the reason that I love college football is the stories of college football. Like, there's no other sport that grabs you with these weird stories and hypotheticals and stories from the past and legends that get created in college football. It's like a never-ending soap opera, and it just has always sucked me in. And it's definitely at least a big part of why I love it. Uh, having just had Kirk Barton on last week, you know, the talking about the Justin Swick, Troy Smith quarterback battle, like, those guys didn't like each other. Swick was by many considered the number one quarterback in the country. Troy was a kid who got kicked out of St. Ignatius, uh, went to Glenville. Justin Swick claims he was lied to. There wasn't going to be another quarterback in the class. Kirk told us the locker room was split. Troy gets suspended in the middle of that battle for a $500 handshake. Uh, Zwick comes out, wins that Alamo Bowl against Oklahoma State. Um, Troy eventually wins the Heisman. I mean, like stories like that abound in college football we've had a ton of them Bo dying before the Michigan game in uh, 2006 that was an amazing story you know crazy drama uh, the flag in the Miami game the 2002 championship game Chris Spielman telling his dad he wanted to go to Michigan and his dad telling him don't ever come home if you do but I could do a whole store a whole show on just stories Ohio State legendary stories and little tidbits like that the things I love about college football along with the football, all the drama that gets created and the soap opera that goes along with it. Because when you mix in young athletes, young college football players, you get some goofy stories. And when you mix in recruiting, which is just insane on its face when you think about, like that Larry Johnson story, these grown men that coach football going and kowtowing to these 17-year-old kids, trying to woo them to come to their school and everything that goes along with recruiting, uh, all the nonsense and the, and the, the you know, the not so good things. I mean, it's just a really wild dynamic. So it sets up for great stories. But another story that's developing that's not done yet is Ryan Day choosing Kyle McCord over J.J. McCarthy, whose dream it was to come to Ohio State. Because now it looks like J.J. McCarthy is actually going to be a top 10 pick maybe even a top five pick. He's already cemented himself as an all-time Michigan legend. His record against that coach who uh, picked the other guy is flawless. And the guy that Ryan Day picked kind of appeared to bust out at Ohio State. Definitely not a fan of Buckeye fans, or definitely not a fan favorite of Buckeye fans. And the story's not over, though, right? Because what if Kyle McCord tears it up at Syracuse? I mean, I know, I don't think it's going to happen, but it could. It definitely could. It's not beyond the realm of possibility. McCord just gave his first interview at Syracuse. December 17th, he signed there uh, with Fran Brown. And Fran Brown's really good. This guy is dynamic. I thought that Dino Babers did a really good job bringing Syracuse back into respectability. I just checked their team talent the other day. 69th in the country, so the cupboard's not bare for Fran Brown. Definitely better than when Babers took over, that's for sure. Babers had some really good wins. Uh, when my son graduated boot camp in South Carolina, I took the family up to Clemson to watch them play, um, to take in their, their campus and see what that was all about. Um, not too impressive, by the way, but I'll tell you who was impressive was Dino Babers in Syracuse, and they almost beat Clemson that day. But uh, Fran Brown took over. This dude's fantastic. Owns every room he's in, and he's got the, the fan base – whatever i don't know how big that fan base is doesn't seem too big but he's got donors contributing he went out and got a bunch of transfers including mccord and i always kind of liked syracuse being good so i'll be rooting for them and i'll be following them closely because i think that the story with mccord and mccarthy and ryan day and that recruitment isn't quite over yet and i don't have a ton of faith in mccord doing great but it could happen. Like, what if that dude makes it to the NFL and J.J. busts out? I don't know, man. 
I don't know. Then it would be instead of Ryan Day missed on recruiting, Ryan Day really didn't develop the kid. We'll see. It's interesting, but another one of those college football stories that I love. And Syracuse might just do all right this year. They've got a really easy schedule. They somehow managed to miss Florida State, Clemson, and North Carolina. And I went through and I handicapped their schedule, and I'll put it up here. Um, I've got them at <clears throat> seven games they'll be the favorite in, and five they'll be the underdogs in. So if they do what they're supposed to do, you know, we're looking at seven wins, and if they do a little better than they're supposed to do, we're looking at nine. And McCord just gave his first interview the other day. Now, he signed December 17th, and his first interview was just now. I find that really crazy. Could you imagine if we signed a transfer quarterback in December and just now heard from him the first time? We'd be going nuts. But uh, there was maybe six people in the press junket, and it was just as bland as you could imagine coming from Kyle McCord, which is very bland. Um, but they asked him one interesting question, and he repeatedly said, things happen for a reason. I'm a firm believer that things happen for a reason, talking about transferring. And I find that really out of context because you don't use that phrase when you are the one that makes that decision. You use that phrase when something out of your control happens to you. But anyway, it didn't surprise me that Kyle McCord had trouble speaking properly. But uh, the Syracuse Orange are definitely on my list of teams that I'm going to be following this offseason and definitely in the next season, along with Georgia for obvious reasons. I think they're the biggest competition and obstacle to a national championship for the Buckeyes. A lot of people in the comments say I'm being awfully dismissive of the folks that stand between Ohio State and Georgia ever meeting uh, in the playoffs, namely Oregon and Michigan. And we could end up, you know, losing against them and still meeting them again in the playoffs and having to play them a couple times. Not Michigan, maybe Oregon. But it's true. We got a lot of games now, now between now and then. But I just think that Oregon is not quite there. I think that Michigan has fallen off a cliff, and I think that Georgia and Ohio State um, stand in a tier by themselves, potentially with Texas. That's how I see this shaking out, and I think Georgia is the, the, the program that's just right there with Ohio State. So I'm comparing Ohio State to Georgia, and that's just the way I'm doing it, so they can talk all the crap they want. But the Syracuse Orange are on my list of teams that I'm going to be following this offseason, and I'm going to be really interested in them. And there's a handful. Um, Georgia, for obvious reasons, and a lot of people, when I talked about Georgia the other day, brought up that talking about Georgia is very dismissive of the Michigan hurdle that Ohio State has to get over and the Oregon hurdle that Ohio State has to get over. But unfortunately, and I didn't want it to be this way, but it is, um, Ohio State doesn't need to get over those as hurdles to face off against Georgia. I mean, they could meet them in a rematch in the playoffs. That could happen. But uh, as far as the regular season, that, uh, that's just not the way it is anymore. They could lose both those games and still – but, but um, obviously, if they lose both those games, then they're not really on the level that I think they're on with Georgia. But uh, I am dismissing them. I, I really am. I think it's going to be a great game against Oregon. I think Ohio State will win. I think Michigan's not on anywhere near the level they were last year um, or even two years ago. So, yeah, to me, it's Ohio State, Georgia, and Texas that are the three big dogs, and I think Texas is still a level behind Ohio State right now. That's the way I view it. So going to be following Georgia closely. Also, I'm going to be following Oregon closely, um, and I will also be following Alabama closely, more to prove myself right because I was a big believer in Kalen DeWar as a head coach. Um, and if for some crazy reason Ryan Day was let go last year, Kalen DeBoer would have been my number one choice. I'm so thankful that that did not happen because I'm a firm believer that recruiting is the lifeblood of a program, and I don't like the decisions that he has made so far down at Alabama when it comes to recruiting. Because you can be an amazing coach, and you can win a national championship being an amazing coach, but you cannot consistently do that unless you consistently stay in those top three rankings in recruiting. And the last 25 years of college football has borne out that as a fact, and it just is. And I think when he realizes the mistakes he's made, it's going to be too late for him to pop up back into that tier of recruiting. Because as I've been saying since the dude got hired, it has been 
there was 24 years between Bear Bryant and Nick Saban, and Alabama finished at the end of the season outside of the top 25 10 times in those 24 years, and they were outside the top 10 16 times. They are not the machine that they think they are, that a lot of the country thinks they are, unless they have a great coach. And in this case, the greatest ever times two. And that's just a fact. But Oregon's definitely on my list. And then moving to the Big Ten, uh, I mean, they immediately became the number two odds on favorite to win the Big Ten. And I didn't expect they would get quite the bump they've gotten as far as recruiting goes. Uh, but they have. And Dan Lanning has turned that up another level. And the support they're getting under Dan Lanning, anything he wants. And that quote from DeCorian Moore, the number one wide receiver in the country, when he said he was down to four schools that he was still going to talk to. And what did he say about Oregon? They're not going to quit. That's what he said about Oregon. So it's very clear to me that Dan Lanning has brought that dirty South recruiting up to the Northwest with him. And uh, he's got more money behind him than almost anybody in the country. So the Big Ten's helped them as well. And they're going to be tough, man. We're going to face off with them on the recruiting trail nonstop, and they're just going to keep getting better. But um, USC, I wasn't expecting the, the things to – this is a recent one, and I talked about it the other day, but, you know, they pulled those two monsters out of Georgia the other day, and then – oh, by the way, somebody in the comments section said Georgia's going to – or Kirby's going to get those two guys back. We'll see. Uh, but Lincoln didn't stop there. The following day, he went and got a top 100 safety out of Jamie French's high school down in Florida. Another one of these 6-1 safeties that all of a sudden we keep seeing everywhere. And I just, it blows my mind. The, the days of the 5-9, uh, you know, five-star corner are gone. That'll never happen again. Uh, you're going to have to be something really special to be a five-star 5-9 five corner. The peanut kid, Gus Cordova, they went and got him. That is a really good uh, tackle out of Austin, who Ohio State was in on, Texas was in on big. And after the peanut story broke, they both backed totally off of him. Well, Lincoln said, I'm taking that kid. And Lincoln took him. And that kid's first statement was, I got to tell you, man, if I'm a coach, like this really irritates me. His first statement upon committing to USC was, USC gets people to the league, and that's always been the goal. I mean, if you are just not bright enough to say in your first statement when you commit to a school, at least something positive about the school you're going to go play at, I don't think you're someone who's probably ever going to get it, uh, particularly when your history is that peanut story. So, yeah, no, I don't have high hopes for Gus Cordova, but everything else USC has been doing recently, they're looking like that priority being placed on defense is, uh, is serious and it's for real. And despite Lincoln having seven years of data as a head coach for us to look at and say, this guy doesn't give a damn about defense. Um, and definitely he needs to show us before we believe it. We need to see it on the field. But it certainly looks like he has kind of turned the page here and he's trying something different. And I'm a firm believer that smart coaches, when they put their mind to something, usually get it done. And he's a smart coach and so is Ryan Day. And just like Ryan Day has made some changes recently, it seems like Lincoln is trying to make this change, and the Big Ten is helping him. And uh, that could be a scary situation in the coming years. And finally, Michigan. Of course, I'm following Michigan. I always follow Michigan. Um, they call that living in my head rent-free. Um, I call that respecting the rivalry, the greatest rivalry in the history of sports. Um, I just always have followed Michigan, you know, not as closely as Ohio State, but I follow them. I follow their recruiting. I follow their coaching staff. I follow everything about them uh, because I like to know my enemy. And they are in a state of total rebuild. They tried to pull the old, keep the band together, um, and everything just kind of backfired and fell apart. So they have a full rebuild on their hands, an entirely new coaching staff, an entire new offensive line. They've got, uh, well, you know, their safety just – tore his ACL. I feel bad for the kid. He could have gone to the draft. He didn't. He stayed, tore his ACL. That sucks. Um, but that that's a big blow to the team. Um, and uh, how's this little nugget I saw today on CBS Sports talking about their quarterback, Alex Orgy. Well, projected to get the starting role, I think, right now. But uh, Orgy has proven to be a dual threat. 
Orgy has proven his dual threat ability in six games of action. Look, I don't know if you guys remember that dude. Uh, big, tough kid, hard runner, always falls forward, gets a couple extra yards. But he's not proven to be a dual threat at all. I don't think we've ever seen him throw a pass. I don't know. What's this? Have you seen him throw a pass? Uh, I think there's a big question mark as to whether he is a dual threat or just a runner. Um, and I don't know if you got this, but Sharon Moore's tagline this year is smash. We're going to smash, which is super tough, Sharon. Uh, and I'd make a lot of fun of it if Ohio State didn't have a tough love banner hanging up in the hoodie. <laughs> but uh, those are the schools I'm going to be following hard this offseason. So Ohio State, Georgia, Oregon, Michigan, USC, Alabama, and sweet little old Syracuse. And that's my show. But before it's over, I do just want to say today is two months of the show. And in my wildest predictions of how this would go for me, uh, month two, 3,000 subscribers and a quarter million views across platforms was nowhere near there. Uh, I, that wasn't making the list. Like, um, I'm blown away. Uh, I'm blown away by the support, the new friendships I've made, the new contacts I've made. Uh, and it's just been amazing. I got no background in media, not a former player, former coach, or an insider. I'm just one of us uh, coming on, bearing it all, man. I'm a fan. I make no bones about it. Uh, I'm proud of it. I'm a little sappy at times. I love Ohio State football. I love what it's been in my life. And I love sharing that with you guys. So I just want to tell you, I really appreciate all the support I've gotten from you guys, the encouragement in the comments. And uh, I'm going to keep going on strong. I'm so excited for what we got going on here, and I appreciate you all very much. So thank you so much, and I will talk to you tomorrow. Jug on Bucks out.